you and I once were sitting in a garage mm-hmm. with multiple Hellcats ready to be taken to an open track. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. With no limitations, go. Right. Yep. And what'd we do? And, and manufacturers said, please take our Hellcats yes. onto the track. Uh-huh. And you decided to spend over an hour discussing uh-huh. EV range, charging abilities, and the direction of EV in the future. Even You're... though I glared at you the entire time saying, Craig, Hellcats, they're right there. I can hear them. I can smell them. I can smell the fuel burning. Let's go. Hello. Welcome to Break Check. I'm Craig. And I'm Brian. And today we have some more news or updates from cars we've been drying. Driving. Drying? Driving. Driving. <laughs> driving. Yeah, driving. Okay, driving, yeah. and we have some car news, some uh, new cars that have come out, and sadly, Brian, some cars that have gone away. We'll talk about that. And then we've got our last segment. We've got cars you wish your dad didn't get rid of. And it didn't have to be your dad. It could be a friend. It could be any any special acquaintance. Uh, just a car that got away in your life. So uh, we're going to stick to our dad on this one, though, and we've, there's a couple that we've got. We'll see if we've got the same one. We have not it's discussed possible. this we, previously. We might. Yeah, we might. So with that, Brian, I am going to kick us off with the first topic. And, you know, normally we do cars we've been driving lately, and we, it's, we're either in a, some press car or we, we're in a rental car. It, sometimes it's one of our own cars. I'm not going to speak, uh, stick to a specific my, make or model in this one, but it's going to be a, about a feature in cars that okay. I was able to experience a I drove someone else's car this week. It happened to be my son's car, but it has a manual. And that that third pedal, it just, look, it's not the best vehicle. It's an old Nissan Xterra that's kind of worn out. But I'm going to tell you. Hold on, hold on. It's not the worst. It's not the worst. No, no, no no doubt. Not the worst. But it's not a sporty car, okay? It's not. Okay, yeah. It's not sporty. It's not necessarily that engaging outside of the manual. And it's not even the best manual in the world. It's not the worst either. I give you that. It's a truck. It's a truck manual, okay? But here's the thing. I drove that thing to work and back, and I got a pretty good commute. It's a 100-mile commute. Because it was a manual, like, I didn't care about all the other stuff. It was just, <laughs> it was just fun to drive. There was something for me to do. And you and I kind of joked about it. I called the only way back. And told you how much fun I was having in this old truck that is bouncy and doesn't handle well because it's got a manual. There's it, look in our lives with automation and the robots taking over everything, right? There's less and less for us to do. There's less for us to control as we, there's less, we, we can't hang on to anything anymore. But if you've got a car with a third pedal, you at least get to decide when it's going to shift and to what gear. And gosh, that is nice. It it is gratifying. And as much as I want to disagree with you because we're brothers and that's what we do, <laughs> I com- completely agree with you, except for the not having control of things like automatic climate control, auto headlights. <laughs> Those are things that I, I don't have a problem with. Eh. You do because you're weird. Um, I don't have a, a control complex over the ventilation. I want it to be at this temperature, no matter <laughs> what's going on outside of the cabin. So we'll just well, be on look, that. I'm down for cli- climate control. I'm with you on that. But okay, uh, you're coming I don't around. Want to start before I get in there. So that's oh, what? Oh, that's a no man thing. That's <laughs> but, that's back in carburetor days. You turn the AC off before you turn the car back. Okay, on. okay, I, listen, I get it. Let's listen, listen. Okay, that's enough. Okay, okay, listen. Okay, but so we're in a nice press car this week. We're not going to reveal it yet because we want to be a little bit of a tease. But it's sadly an automatic in a vehicle that has an option for a manual and it's Which, fun. by and large is the biggest problem with the car and it, there's yeah, not and, many and, problems with it and it's a fun car even with the automatic don't get me wrong this car that we're sure. in but oh if it was a manual it would be so much better and we're just missing it in this and that's yeah um one of the things that hit me when i was driving the xterra is there's a lot of talk about well one of the reasons manuals have died is because Manufacturers have abandoned them. They didn't update them. They're, they don't have R&D money for that because nobody's buying them. So they don't make good ones anymore. There's not good manuals. And so the question becomes, do you want to drive a okay-ish, decently good automatic or a 
kind of not great manual. And not I'm sorry, manual. I pick the manual every time. <laughs> yeah, every time. And, and look, I want to go back to your Xterra comment a minute ago because it really rings true to me with our upraising in vehicles. We did not grow up in a house with Porsches. Mm-mm. We did not grow up in a house with even sports cars at our uh, impressionable age. Dad had some Celicas and some some cool MGBs and Roadrunners, all these cool things in his past, but not when you and I were of adolescent age, of uh, right. teenage age, when we're starting to drive. Right. Most likely on purpose. Uh, we did have insurance bills like anybody else. Um, right. But we did have some manuals that were, by modern standards, quite terrible. <laughs> but by our time frame and our engagement, unbelievably fun. And something that we get into new cars all the time and go, this was more fun <laughs> in the in the 90s and 2000s. Yeah. You know, you, I'm going to go, I'm going to point back to you real quick. You talked about truck transmissions and something about the Xterra that a lot of people don't realize is that the six speed in the Xterra is by and large the CD09 or CD009 transmission from the 350Z. Mm-hmm. It's not exactly the same. The ratios aren't exactly the same. Um, it's a different RPM range as well. But, but nonetheless, it, a lot of the architecture is identical, which is partially why it is as good as it is. This is true. I want to go back to a Ford Ranger that you bought. The first brand new vehicle you bought was a forest green Ranger Sport, <laughs> regular cab, short bed, mm. manual, mm. with a two five four cylinder that had eight spark plugs for whatever. <laughs> it couldn't burn right reasons. It wasn't for and efficiency. <laughs> no, it was not for efficiency, or it may, maybe it was emissions. I don't know. It uh, wasn't for power. <laughs> it, there, no, there was no power to be gained. By the way, this was the last iteration of the Pinto four cylinder. No one really thinks about that, but that's what that was. <laughs> yep. Um, but the genius to behold is that it was bolted to a by and large Mazda Miata transmission, <laughs> yes. which, which was like a hidden gem in the truck world. Because I remember, look, the first week of my license, you said, "Hey, little brother, I want you to drive this to school for a couple of days." I'm not sure what you were thinking. What was I but, thinking? But that transmission was phenomenal, and in the air, it still shifted great when wheels aren't okay. Around. Just, just for See, no, just putting that out there. It exactly. was awesome. Well, yeah, I don't know. Again, I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, this but, is just. I'm glad we've got on, <laughs> on the on at recorded evidence that you completely uh, abused the, my gracious gifts I gave to wait, you. But but that's okay. I never, I never said that. I never said that. <laughs> you want to talk about the tourist station wagon borrowed one time? Oh, uh, that's that's another. We can flip that another day, Craig. We don't need to bring that apart now. <laughs> <laughs> um, save that for the next episode. That's a good one. That's a dent story. I'll, I'll use that in the next. Oh dent yeah, story. No, that will be a really good dent story. Um, okay. Okay. So, but you've got a topic in same kind of thing for you. You don't really have a car necessarily to report on, but something about the joy of grand touring, and you've got a, like a Raptor log for us. So. I do, yeah. I want to call call it the Raptor Log. And and by the way, we've driven a lot of cars since the last time we recorded podcasts, but yes. they were, uh, well, let's just save those for, other, for another episode because yep. there's just so many we can go through. But Raptor Log, uh, for those that don't know, my daily driver is a first-generation Raptor. It's just an F-150. It does the family stuff. It's way too wide for normal living in parking lots, um, but it does all the competency things right. It's super comfortable, very nice, terrible on fuel economy, so on and so forth. Um, I've had... Since the last time we recorded a podcast, I've had two road trips, one to Houston, actually Houston twice for the Houston Auto Show and then for another family visit, and then also a trip to New Orleans. So I put a lot of miles in the truck. In fact, over Memorial Day weekend, I put 1,400 miles on, uh, went down to see family, and one of our viewers, or viewers, listeners, uh, pre pre I'm talking to you, <laughs> and um, might be the listener, I'm not sure. So <laughs> I put 1,400 miles on it. And I thought it was interesting that I ended up getting 14 miles a gallon round trip on it. Mm-hmm. I just thought that was funny, which in mm-hmm. my daily driving, I get 12. So I was happy with that. Oh, um, so you got good mileage, 14. Yeah. It was awesome. I was happy <laughs> with that. I gained two on this drive. It was it was great. Um, but ba- much like your exterior experience, I was reminded, I looked back, and we look, you and I are, are very fortunate to be exposed to new cars routinely all the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, they get graciously delivered to us by manufacturers we get to use and abuse and test them and report on them and, and make fun content for for our fans uh, we love it but it is refreshing to get into something old and realize that the bones and basics of what a car should be is more important than the tech that is currently installed in the car mm. and that's what i kept reflecting on while i was driving this truck i went look this truck is 
nine years old, has 166,000 miles. Um, it's by and large only had tires and shocks done to it. it had, it's had some basic maintenance things, but nothing significant has been done to this truck. And it just runs. And my kids are sleeping in the back and they're comfortable. My wife is reading a book on her, t- on her little tablet on the side. And it just does all these things. And I, I kept thinking, if I had a, if I had 75 inches of screen in here, like the Jeep Grand Wagoneer, this drive would not be any better. It wouldn't make me a better driver. It wouldn't make this more enjoyable. Because um, at a certain point, at a certain amount of time, if you spend the car, like there, it doesn't matter what's on the screen. So I thought that was interesting. Um, and it also reminded me of something that I forgot I enjoyed so much, and that is the Grand Tour. Mm. And I don't, I don't mean the TV show on Amazon that's really just Top Gear again, uh, <laughs> post Clarkson punching someone. What I mean <laughs> is that in Europe they have something called Grand Touring, and basically it's where you know usually wealthy people get in a comfortable sports coupe, luxury coupe, and they transit from country to country quickly at interstate speeds or Autobahn speeds, depending on where they're going. In our version, it hit me while driving I-45, going from DFW to the Houston region, uh, four times in one weekend. Uh, I realized that that is the closest thing that we have Mm. to an Autobahn because the speed limit is 75, and there's low entry and exit points. There's not a bunch of entry points you can sustain high speeds for a long time. And, and on two of these legs, I had a, an Infinity Q60 for the run. And it reminded me how much I enjoy taking something that has, you know, 300-ish horsepower, is decently slippery through the air, and is fun to sustain high speeds. It's just a lot of fun. Mm. And I think it's easily missed when people buy cars. They think about what's their 60 time. They think about what's the fuel economy, what's all this kind of stuff. I keep thinking about what about you and your significant other or you and a friend or even you by yourself getting in and going for a blast for a significant period of time. Is it good at that? Like Miatas aren't good at that. Um, Some tighter sports cars aren't good at that. Big trucks usually aren't good at that because they're so windy. Uh, It depends what your speed is. You know, if you're reasonably, it's fine. But that Q60 really reminded me how good that was. And it was was fun. It's a pastime that I think Americans need to take more advantage of. Yeah, yeah. uh, I think of two things you talk about grand touring and uh, yeah, that, that is a, it's almost, it's a niche that is not just, not a lot of people need or care about or buy cars for. So, um, but is a, a car that can do that is just really special. It means it can do a lot of things well, right? Maybe, maybe not necessarily the best at anything else though. Um, so yeah, exactly. I couldn't, I think you nailed I could, it. Yeah. I couldn't help but think of the cannonball run movies, uh, where they drive across the country <laughs> at high speeds. Um, I couldn't, and I also can't help but think, I remember reading about the, when the Boss 302 came out. Oh yeah. And I remember reading, uh, I can't remember which, I'm sure it was one of the writers at Motor Trend. I was probably what I was reading at that time. And I was, there were just, one of the things that kind of kept coming up over and over is a lot of the people that were driving, the journalists that were driving it kept saying, look, this is a car I can hop in and drive across the country. It's decent around the track is yeah it's a drag right. car it can do all these things but i can it's also comfortable. comfortable enough to drive this across the country and that gets you thinking about oh that that's a good car and so yeah I, i'm glad you brought this up because that is a a something that just gets overlooked and not talked about much and so it's a really yeah. good point and i think it's really relevant relevant to me personally and, and also a lot of people in texas because look a lot of people do these metro area to metro area trips routinely yeah, And so they, and I'm going to bring up, I'm not trying to rag on Honda in particular, but we have an older Honda Accord. Our mom has an, an older, older Honda Accord. And every time I do longer stints in those, and they're not the only ones, but generally smaller front-wheel drive cars aren't as good at that. They've got a little more road noise. They've got a little more wind noise. And it doesn't seem like much when you're buying the car. But after an hour and a half, two hours, you you're start exhausted. to get... Yeah, you get you get fatigued. It's like driving a lawnmower. Your hands get vibrating after a while. You know, it's right? funny. Like so they talk about this a little bit in the overlanding community. They care about this a little bit more. It's which is funny because overlanding seems to be taking over everything in the automotive world. I don't right. understand it, but I'm. This is one of the things that I agree with in that world is they talk about driver fatigue. That's a big thing in overlanding. So when you got to cover a long distance for a long on a long day, whether it's dirt roads or on pavement. You want it to be comfortable. That's that's important. And so completely. This is basically an on road overlanding thing. Um, yeah, driver fatigue's a thing and uh and car manufacturers do care about it. I'm not saying they don't, but you're right. Most people buy a car, they, they quick test drive, they're just gonna drive around town. 
you don't think about having to drive it for five hours. And no, so that's, no. yeah. Um, and, and I would tell anyone listening right now, if you're going to go buy a car and you do this periodically, or you have a commute like, like you do, Craig, or like I used mm-hmm. to, or pre-free like you do, um, if you are traveling 50 miles a day one way, get in that car, get on the highway, set the cruise at 80 and see what it's like, because that is going to yep. change your day completely. Yeah, if the RPM's at 3,500 RPM at 80, it's going to be a Not buzz box and it's going to kill yeah. you. If it's got some weird wind noise and it's just so noisy in there you can't stand it, it's going to get you. I mean, bring a decibel meter with you and see what totally. it reads. Compare other totally. cars to it and you'll get, you'll get some. That's one of my favorite measurements on cars is what's the decibel meter? What are the decibels inside at 70 right. miles an hour? At sustain. Yeah. Like set yeah. the cruise, sustain speed, what is it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well. All right. Well, I beat that dead horse, but that's one of the things I want to just put out there that people don't think about. I'm now, as a buyer, I think about it a lot. Um, you know, it makes it hard for me to go buy a Miata as a as a dedicated vehicle, uh, or not dedicated vehicle, as a daily. I think yeah. about that kind of stuff. I agree. Uh, well, good topic. Thanks for bringing that up. Let's dig into some car news now. Let's start off with um, some new cars we've seen before we get into right. the cars we're losing. Uh and that is your favorite topic. We got two new. Do you want to guess what they are? What kind of cars? What kind of propulsion system? I'm afraid. I'm EVs. hoping they're. Oh man. <laughs> do we yes. have to do this? Oh yeah. Well, well, we don't have a choice. Everything that's announced these days is an EV. <laughs> <laughs> wait, okay. wait, Craig. There's mm. the Toyota Corolla Cross. Let's talk about that. Or is that EV as well? It's not an EV, but they did announce okay. an, Toyota did announce another EV during all that. So before uh, you bore and and uh, push our audience away, I would like to remind everyone that you and I once were sitting in a garage <laughs> with multiple Hellcats ready to be taken to an open track. Uh huh. Uh huh. With no limitations, go right. Yep. And what we do? And, and manufacturers said, "Please take our Hellcats." Yes. Onto the track. Uh huh. And you decided to spend over an hour discussing uh-huh. EV range, charging abilities, and the direction of EV in the future. Even yeah. though I glared at you the entire time saying, <laughs> Craig, Hellcats, they're right there. I can hear them. I can smell them. I can smell the fuel burning. Let's go. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, and you're welcome, audience. I was thinking of y'all. I know this is the future. As much as we would like is to it? try to ignore it's not, it's the future, it's coming. Um, although there's some interesting hydrogen things that have come out lately. But let's get into the EVs. I would like to, let's in the future, let's do an EV. Uh, no, I don't want to do another EV episode. But, well, we'll come back to that later. I don't want to do that. <laughs> okay. Well, Hyundai and Kia announced two new vehicles this week. I don't know if you've got the chance to see these or if you even cared at all. I sent you a I picture have. of one of them. Yep. Um, in fact, it was, was kind of really- pixely. Yeah, and there were some really weird things. So the first one, let's talk about the first one I sent you. The first one I sent you was the Hyundai Ioniq 5. And Brian, the picture I sent you was a lady sitting behind the car with her laptop. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think what else she even had. I think like a waffle maker. No, and, and like a watermelon or something. It was like some fruit next to a waffle maker. Made no it, sense. It was really weird. And like a juicer or something. I don't know what she was doing. Right. Was, maybe that's what it was. It was really confusing. But the point they were trying to show is that you can plug in some things to the car and it'll power like your laptop in a waffle maker. Like, who does that? Like, <laughs> who needs their laptop in a waffle maker? Like, it's, it's yeah, silly. Yeah, like... It, it it makes me think that there was a marketing meeting where someone said, guys, we've identified a new segment of the market. And I only bring that up because like it, that's it, cool. It, like <laughs> that's cool if it's if it's a hybrid because it can power it. But right. if it's a battery, you're just draining the battery. Like <laughs> I don't know. Well, I don't get it. I'm gonna add to your EV in a minute when you're done with these uh two. I've got one more to add to it. They'll okay. touch on okay. that. So anyways, the Ionic five, uh don't know if you saw it, but this is part of uh, Hyundai and Kia's new um, global EV architecture. They've got a fancy name for it. I don't have it handy yeah. in front of me here, but um, they're it's actually a whole skateboard uh, platform with different uh, bodies on it. Here we go. Idea. The Electric Global Modular Platform, or yep, there it is, EGMP. So keep that in mind. Ooh. We're gonna be hearing that in a lot. This is the first of like eleven, or this and the Kia. Like they have eleven vehicles coming soon. Uh, there's gonna be a Soul EV, another one. They got a lot of EVs coming quick. And so um, 
it's you can get it in one of the things that I do like about the EV future, Brian, is they seem to be all wheel drive or rear wheel drive. Or rear wheel drive. So Which I, I like love, that as well. I, I yes. do want to give some credit on that. I'm a, I'm a little bit excited about that. I do love that when given the option of powering the front or the rear wheels and packaging is no longer a constraint with these EVs. All the manufacturers, like, it's a full admission that, yeah, rear-wheel drive is where it's supposed to be. <laughs> so Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's an admission that, uh, given the option dynamically, we want that in the back. Absolutely, because the packaging constraints are gone, so dynamics do matter. Right. So let's let's make it let's make it good. And so just like all EVs, you can get just rear-wheel drive or all-wheel drive. All-wheel drive is quicker, has a bigger battery, yada, yada, yada. They're all about 300-mile range. The neat thing about this one is they're claiming a really quick, charge time um but again i don't know how you're going to get that installed in your house which house is going to have that and so it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see interesting to see how they handle that the really interesting thing about the ionic 5 is this is a big car it's it's it almost doesn't look that big almost looks like a compact it looks pretty big um in fact, the dimensions it, are the wheelbase. It's the longest wheelbase in the Hyundai lineup, believe it or not. So, see that really caught me off guard because when you sent the photos and I looked at a bunch of other press photos and the press kits, I went, "Man, that looks like a little bit bigger sole, maybe a Kia Sportage size, yeah. something like that." Not Celto small, but you know, um, not Tucson by any means, not uh, Sorrento by any means. Mm-hmm. And I got to looking at it and saw the scale of like people standing by it and that kind of stuff. And went, oh, this is like a Ford Edge or bigger. This is like longer mm-hmm. than that. But like width wise, it's like a Ford Edge. And that's that's more formidable. That's kind of Mach E territory. That's kind of mm-hmm. ID4 territory. So yep. it's that segment is really heating up. It is heating up. And this is one of them that's going to help that. It's, I don't know what you thought about the styling. Um, here's what I thought was really unique, though. I loved how they made it. It almost looked Radwood cool a little bit in its 80s oh, man. pixelations. Like yeah. the, all the lighting uh, treatment on the exterior was like pixelated. So it looked like it was, it looked very, it looked really neat. I don't know what you thought. Of, what did you think about that? Man, I'm going to steal a word from you. I think they're being a little too cute, but <laughs> it's, I felt like, like, first of all, take the ruler away from the designers, <laughs> right? Put some arc back into it, which ID4 had a sweeping line all the way down the side. And I keep going back to that because those two are definitely going to be competing with each other. And while the the, the Pixel 5, whatever, the Ionic 5, whatever it's called, is going to be cooler, like you said, it's going to be the Radwood cool. I think they're, it's probably the right way to go. Uh, I think the person buying an electric car is going to appreciate something a little bit eclectic, a little bit look at me. I'm a little bit different. Whereas ID4 is just going to be, it's going to blend in and be just a car, and I appreciate that more. I, I want an electric car that doesn't shout, I'm electric. So mm. that's, and the Mach-E does that too. The Mach-E just looks good in general. Take the electric part out of it, it's still a great looking shape. Um, but I'm a little weird with styling, and styling is definitely subjective. I don't think it's ugly. I will say that. It's not offensively ugly. It's just a little, it's not really my style. Like, it's like wearing a fedora. I'm not going to, I'm just not that guy. Right. No, I, I understand, and it's, it's not going to be for everyone. It's going to be interesting. Um, then, then, so let's continue what the Hyundai Kia bandwagon Kia also, or Hyundai and Kia also announced another electric vehicle. I think the Kia was announced right before the Hyundai. Yeah, it's the Kia EV6. Um, same deal. Yes. Same. Basically, it's 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 the twin. It's the Hyundai Kia twin. Um, completely different approach in the styling. It's definitely sleeker. Definitely sportier looking. I don't know if you've had a chance to look at it much. Um, yeah, a little bit. I, I, in terms of styling, it does a, it aligns with me a little better, a lot better actually. So okay, so if you had to buy one of them, you would which you would buy that one based on the styling. Yeah, I would. And look, here's the thing that really is appealing to me: there is a segment of the world that's going to make good use of EVs. I don't think that you and I and our grand touring previous conversation mm-hmm. really works well with that. Right. And that's still my hang up with EVs. I'm not anti EV purely. Right. I just don't think it's there for – as often as I make those trips, it's just not – I'm going to be stressing the whole time. And then when I get to right. use, I'm going to plug it in to someone's power cord, and it's going to take two weeks to charge up and all this kind of stuff. So I'm a little <laughs> – I'm not quite there, right? Right. Um, but this makes me excited because Kia and Hyundai are good at the basics of building a car. Ergonomics yep. are good. Build yep. quality is by and large good. Materials are very depending on trim, but yep. you do have a good very variability there. So I'm excited to see where it goes. I think it's going to be something interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I'm with you, and on the styling, I I agree. I would probably end up in the Kia. I would keep telling myself, "Hey, the Ionic is cool and unique and different." 
But when it comes, when I had to actually live with it, I would get the key because it just styling just seems to me less offensive. So I'd probably end up in that. So yeah, yeah, exactly. And they both do the same party tricks. You can charge other <laughs> things with the power cord and all that fun stuff. Um, here's what I want to end this conversation with on these two new, these two cars. Okay, it's two more uh, specifically purpose built EV cars. You know, uh, originally we had the Teslas. And then we had all the other manufacturers just converting existing cars to EVs. Okay, yeah. And, and they just weren't that good. Remember the, the Ford Ranger EV years ago, the, the Mini, oh, e, the electric Mini. Um, you had yeah. all these, the electric Golf, the e-Golf, which is cool because, okay, it just looks like a regular car, but they just inherently weren't designed from the ground up, and so they had they weren't they're the adaptations. best they could be. Yeah, they're yeah, adaptations. Exactly, exactly. Versus the, this, these two cars, the Mach-E, the ID4, these are cars that are, you're not going to see a gas version and you're not going to see, it's not just a gas version turned to electric. It's, they're unique. And so I'm, it's interesting to see what the future is going to look like as electric cars are built from the ground up with the sole purpose of them being an electric car. So it'll be interesting to see how that evolves, how it changes these. It's, I, one of the things I'm excited about is as more car manufacturers start doing this exact thing, they seem to be a little more excited and a little more intriguing than at the first few were. So there's some yeah, hope. Th- Hopefully as they evolve, there's more of that and it'll be interesting to see how that goes. I think you you have nailed it there. There's gonna there's been some lessons learned already. Mm-hmm. Um you brought up the Electric Ranger and man, I for completely forgot about that. But I remember reading about that in Motor Train and going, Holy crap, what is this? And then and dad even saying, son, that might be the future and granted that was twenty years ago, but <laughs> 25 years ago, maybe. But anyways, it, it was interesting then. I remember the charging port was in the grill. Yes. And I was actually, I was really like perplexed, like, but where's the air going to go? And the dad just said, why do you need air to go through there? And you know, like my, <laughs> like as a kid, I'm going through, I, I knew what a radiator was. I knew what the cooling system concept was. And, and it kind of hit me like, oh my God, this is going to be different. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It's uh, so we've come a long way. So we'll see how it continues. It'll, it'll be interesting. I, I do want to share a tidbit about EV and, uh, it'll be, I'll be brief, I promise. Okay. This ties into what you brought up with our hour-long, felt like four-year-long conversation with EVTS, <clears throat> excuse me, EVTS and Blink charging. And we mm-hmm. talked about range and cost per mile. And so they did a really good job explaining to us that what a kilowatt hour was and how that relates to what it costs. And, and we um, did some calculations on the Mach-E that we had previously reviewed. Uh, and it I came did. up... You did, yeah. You did about 17 different calculations, but one of them <laughs> uh, did not involve a toaster, did not involve a dryer. It involves what does it cost per mile based on electricity rates in our range in our region right now. And it was seven cents worth of energy cost per mile is what you came up with. Mm-hmm. We had a, there's another journalist, uh, automotive journalist group in Tyler, Texas that we uh, collaborate with a lot. And they went down to the Houston Auto Show as well. They did not take a Raptor. They took a Chevy Cruze uh, Eco. Which and, means it has a manual. Which means it has a manual, which is awesome. Uh, props to them. It's actually kind of a fun car. They did really good with that. Good choice, Corey. And he did the math on it as well. Would you like to guess what it cost him per mile to make that trip? Uh, Around seven cents. Exactly seven cents a mile. <laughs> and so it makes me think about, and uh, and he brought this up. We, we texted about this a little bit. He brought this up. His car is a good example. Do you remember that I had a Jetta before the Raptor? I had a 1.4 turbo manual Jetta, mm. and it would get 40 miles a gallon no matter what you did. Um, and it was the kind of car that you put your foot to the floor and then start it and then go where you're going. Just don't take your foot off ever, and it's fine. <laughs> and it still got 40 miles a gallon. And so I'm kind of going, look, in terms of efficiency of the the ICE engine, we were making some good strides. And so... I'm curious, I'm a little perplexed where the abandonment of that is coming from. I think a lot of it is mm-hmm. trends in the automotive industry, and that may be for another discussion another day, but it's interesting because I think we're, we are making great headway with EVs, but we are also ignoring some great progress we had with ICE engines previously. Yeah, it'll be agreed. It'll be interesting to see how this uh, evolves or devolves. We'll, uh, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, it'll be interesting. Okay, Brian, we've also lost two cars. Oh, uh, boy. Moment of silence. Um, prayers for the another two more gas engines, gas vehicles gone. And that is Brian, my beloved, dearly beloved, 
My, not only did I lose the Mazda 2 a while back here stateside, <laughs> the, they at least gave me the Scion IA a while back. They had an IA hatch. Automatic. Um, they had a Toyo- then it turned into a Toyota Yaris IA. Um, and at least I had that, okay? Because all Mazda left me with was a CX-3. It was a Mazda 2, basically SUV or crossover. Crossover, yeah. And again, just like that uh, IA hatch was auto only, it was auto only. You know what, though? At least it was a Mazda 2 because, you know, I've got – there's a special spot in my heart for a Mazda 2. And for yeah, those the, other – Mazda 2 is a for – the, for the audience that doesn't know, it's a four-door Miata in all reality. <laughs> yes. It, it drives and, really good. And there's about 50 people on the planet that care about it, and I'm one of those. So – Yeah. Well, so it's gone, Brian. They've killed it. They've murdered it. It's wait, gone. Wait. They killed a crossover? I – I get, yep. wait, what? Yes, dead. See ya. Sayonara. Zilch. But, but wait a minute. Five years ago, crossovers were the future. What's happening to those now? You know, it's interesting. I really think what happened here, this is just Mazda's, a, we've talked about this before, Mazda's a small company. Uh, they, one of the things I think they do well is they hang on to heritage when they need to, but abandon it when they don't need to keep it. Um, okay. you know, there's yeah. no more protégés. There's no more uh, Mazda speed things. They don't care. They're going to, they're gonna they're gonna adapt. They're gonna change. They're gonna stay nimble, and so they can't also have too many cars. They need to keep it what works and what doesn't. And so, CX three wasn't working. I think the CX five was just eating its lunch. Um, and why Which is get a great, CX three if you get a CX five? Yeah. Right. The CX five is a is a great option. It really is. Oh, absolutely. And so, but with that, Brian, not only did we lose a Mazda two, we lost another car, and. The car, as you and I both know, is slowly dying. And by car, I mean sedan or coupe, um, anything that's not I a really, crossover, SUV. I or don't want to hear you say this. <laughs> but And we lost a good one, a good-looking one, and that is the Mazda 6. Ah, uh, no. They did a good nope. job with that thing. They refreshed it a few years ago. They put the turbo in it finally. It was so. It was such a premium car for a good and a good value, and it rode well. It was quite – oh. Brian. Craig, that was a, not only was it a good looking car, it was a great driving car. Oh, and one good. of the last oh. Mazas that, that is not the Miata, Miata with Holton was standing, one of the last great driving Mazas that they still sold. I'm a little bit sad that that's gone. I'm actually really sad that's gone. It is sad. Um, if there's any solace, Brian, all this means is they're making room for a new model. And I think the reason they had to kill the Mazda 6, at least, I don't know about the 6.3. Is the rumor is they've got a new sedan coming based on some of their concept cars, probably going to be rear wheel drive, Ooh. and the rumor is straight six. They really are going for BMW. They've been they, alluding to that for a long time. Yeah. They mean it. They yeah. So don't know if there's any basis to any of those rumors, uh, but that's been thrown out there. And oh gosh, if that's true, uh, yeah, that's exciting. we're going to miss you six, but we welcome the new one. So let's we'll see. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Look, I'm not one to get in the way of progress. If they're talking in line six and rear-wheel drive, goodbye, six. <laughs> yeah, see ya. <laughs> see ya. Um, okay, uh, there's a, a lot more car news we could get into when we develop our little list for this podcast tonight. Uh, some of these things hadn't happened, but since we've developed our list, we had some Ford Maverick news and a bunch of Toyota news. I'm just oh, going to tell you, I'm not even going to get into the Toyota news because there's so much. There's a TRD Pro color. There's a TRD Trail. There's a Corolla Cross, there's an EV, there's a G, there, yeah, uh, GR86. Got their, it's ridiculous. Right. Uh, basically, I hate to send you to another website, but go to the website and look at all of them. They're pretty cool. But let's briefly, if you would, talk touch on the Ford Maverick real quick, and then we'll get into uh, our last segment. Yeah, let's update the people. Um, we've been talking about these smaller unibody trucks like the Hyundai Santa Cruz and then also the Maverick. And Ram also had an option that is currently in production in other countries. Um, we've also, for those that haven't listened, we've, we've explained that we don't think there's a huge market for this, but the photos, while it won't be officially launched or revealed until the eighth, um, some photos have already been leaked out, uh, as of this afternoon. And it, it confirms everything we already thought. It's independent rear suspension. It appears to be sharing the same chassis as the Bronco Sport, not the full size Bronco, the, the baby Bronco. That's a good thing. Which is a good thing. We love that. Go check out a review on YouTube for that. That was really impressive, that thing. Um, and by the way, it's not the full Bronco before you comment and, and say that it is. It's not. It's a Bronco Sport. Um, <laughs> those, those, those of you playing the drinking game, there you go. 
There you go. And uh, But, no, it's great. So that's good news to me because I think the ergonomics of the uh, interior on the Bronco Sport was really good. And it was one of those surprisingly quiet and comfortable on the highway cars. Really caught me off guard. Um, they don't make a lot of small cars that do that very well. So if the Maverick follows suit, I'm excited about that. That's the real news. And it does look better than I thought it was going to. Um, kudos to Ford. I think they're going to sell more than I initially anticipated. I think it's going to cut into the Ranger sales. But I don't think it's going to be a, a, a big barn stopper. Um, if anything, it's going to hurt the Ranger. Because yeah. it just looks more modern. And, and the Ranger may be at risk of going away. I don't know. Uh, that's a that's a Ford question there, but the Santa Cruz is not going to be as dominant, I think, as the Maverick will be. You're right. Well, be interesting to see what happens there. Uh, I'll throw in some other little rumors along with that Maverick news, and that is uh, the new Ranger has already been spied, uh, yep. being tested. So sounds like we are getting a new Ranger soon. Um, and the rumors I've heard on the Ranger and the Maverick also are there's going to be a Maverick hybrid. And there's going to okay. be a Ranger EV, so it'll be interesting to see how those play out and what those look like. So we'll see how I've, that goes. On top of that, I've also heard that there's been an off-road variant uh, spied already of the, the new Ranger. Mm. I no, don't know if it's the Ranger Raptor or not, or maybe it's just the, the trimmer or if it's Ford. No, curious to see what happens there. Time will tell. Okay, last topic: uh, cars you wish your dad didn't get rid of, or any car that just got away from you in life. Uh, who's the, the yeah. car that car, got away? You know, cars of your childhood. What what was impressionable to you that you missed and wish was still here? Yes. And so, Brian, do you want to go first in this, or do you want me to go first? What do you want to do? Um, I, you know what? How about you go first this time? Okay, I'll go first on this one. And Brian, I bring to you. Uh, hopefully, not the same car that you've got, but I bring to you the 1992 Dodge Spirit ES. Oh man. With the, I want to just give you the specs here. The three liter V6 built by Mitsubishi, with with the <laughs> Eurocast or better known as Snowflake wheels. Yes, which were awesome. And so th this particular car was our mom's. It, it was a white car with white wheels. <laughs> that was white late eighties, early nineties. Total coolness, right there. You couldn't beat that. And those were the the performance wheels. And by the way, they were very very heavy. Oh, oh, yeah. But they looked awesome. Oh, they're um, amazing. Had a four-speed auto uh, built by Chrysler. Um, well, Three-speed sometimes. Yeah, not the best. Yeah, a lot of, oh, didn't have that four, fourth gear a lot of times. Yeah. <laughs> but it taught me how to drive really well. Um, and then, Brian, did you think that car was fast? I thought it was the fastest thing on the planet. Bar none. <laughs> yeah. At that yeah. age, I, I remember you did a burnout uh, on... <laughs> in the road in front of our house, turning around to go back to the house or something, you felt compelled to, <laughs> from reverse to drive, give it a little RPM and neutral, and then as soon as it started spinning, to just floor it completely. Well, and, um, maybe why we didn't have fourth gear sometimes. Well, those before the transmission broke. We don't really know what happened after that. Anyways, um, <laughs> that car did have a limited slip differential, which Dad told us why that was so good multiple times, and oh. you proved right there that it did because I saw tire smoke on both windows. It was awesome. Oh, wasn't that awesome? Well, Glorious. do you want to guess how much horsepower that, that V6 made? Look, I, I think I remember the number, but I was can I just tell you what I thought it was as a kid? Sure. 9,000. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll go back and I'll look this thing up, and I'm thinking, like, it's got to make at least over 150, right? It's got to make 160, mm. 170. Nope. God, it, surely 200, <laughs> right? No, no. 141 horsepower run. Oh God! One I, I thought forty I believe, one. I, I remember it being one forty. I was one horsepower off, but my gosh! But what was the torque though? Because that engine, you know, I don't, I don't have that handy in front of me. But okay, how many cars today decent. don't even? I mean, it's hard to find a car that makes less than that. But you know what's funny is we drove recently some cars that had about one hundred and twenty horse, give or take. Mm -hmm. Granted, they were hooked to CVTs, mm -hmm. and they were light cars. They had small wheels, and they felt like complete, complete ashtrays to drive around. They were unbelievably terrible. That's true. And, it, and just a racket. They didn't feel fast. And so I think that torque number might have helped us out because the tire spin and all that kind of stuff might have helped out. Feeling yeah, faster. absolutely. Uh, what, interesting facts on this car. Um, so, again, this is our mom's car, but a car that you and I kind of cut our teeth on driving-wise. For sure. And, yeah. and we learned a lot about handling, and we learned a lot about understeer big time. Um, you did particularly. Me I know. I, I really learned about understeer. I learned that what happens with when there's understeer, Brian – 
uh, there's nothing you can do. <laughs> there's nothing you can do. Yeah. <laughs> so I uh, learned about that really well. see a previous podcast where we dig into that. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's the enemy. Uh, car did handle well for what it was for a four-door family car. What was really neat about the Dodge Spirit, though, Brian, is they had an RT version that yes. made like 225 horsepower, somewhere around there. Not even that much. Not even that much more, but we thought that was just the unbelievable pocket rocket of, of the day. Yeah. And that was when Dodge was going after Ford, the Taurus SHO. It was really kind of cool. Um, this front-wheel drive shootout, sedan shootouts they were doing. Um, but it, basically, we thought our Spirit ES was basically as good as that. Um, extra couple cylinders better. It wasn't. Uh, also, I want to tell you some of the bad news about that that V6, uh, as much as we thought it would rip. Um, you know what else it did besides losing a, a gear every now and then? Uh, burned a little oil, Craig, if I remember burned correctly. Burned a little, lost a lot of oil in the, in the engine. Uh, yes. And through the exhaust. Uh, yeah. Lots yes. of white smoke. Yes. Uh, it could be used as a decoy if someone was following you. You could, you know. Sure. Uh, smoke, so, smoke them out. Um, some memories I have of that car. Um, one, the valve guys were made of cardboard, I think, because of the oil <laughs> situation. And it was a four speed with air quotes because fourth gear didn't always work. And um, I remember at one point, dad just said, don't go over 70 <laughs> because overdrive was broken. Yeah. And we may have creeped past that a little bit. Um, but but when I will say when fourth gear did work, do you know what dad did with us in that car? I remember some high speed us. runs. Yes. The first time that I don't know about you, but the first time that I hit 120 miles an hour was in that car. And it was a it was a really pretty good car. I mean, I, it was I, it it boogied and it did. I remember it had these had those gray with red stripe or not red. It was like kind of a contrasting like eighties style stripe uh, upholstery. Oh yeah, it was and terrible. But it yeah. was atrocious. It cool. And by the way, I look at these things all the time. I can't find them anywhere in running condition. Because <laughs> um, they don't run. These up. Yeah, they don't run. Yeah, they're terrible. And um, the RTs you can find those. By the way, the RT version. Had the Turbo 4, which was kind of a first of its kind. Back then, it was like V6 or nothing. And um, they were faster than the Fox Body Mustang of the time, which was a yeah. big deal. Yeah. So, um, cool car, well, cool option. As much as we like, you know, maybe we dog in that car and as maybe as bad as that car was. You know how many they sold in 1992? They sold no. 97,000, almost 100,000 of those units. Holy cow. Were sold in 1992. And by the way, that was its best year. All. The other years okay. were about 80, 70, 60,000. They kind of went up and down. But in 1992, they sold almost 100,000 of those bad boys. So I remember watching a Motor Week years ago, and they weren't that harsh on it. They were actually pretty impressed with it, with its European style handling. <laughs> yeah. That being brought up a few times. <laughs> All right. Well, anyways, that was mine. Uh, what, what do you have? Um, I am going, I thought we were going to have the same car. We, really, we were close, close era. Um, and by the way, before we leave the Spirit, do you know what we replaced that car with, Craig? Oh, I do know what we replaced that with. A Dodge, sorry, not a Dodge, a Chrysler Neon ES, green with taupe interior, and a three-speed automatic. Now, it didn't even come with a fourth gear. <laughs> and by the way, it was the same architecture transmission. They just took overdrive off and sold us a three-speed. No, speed. no, so you're right about this. A fun fact on the Dodge Spirit, in 92 was the last year the four-speed was available on the V6. They okay. dropped they dropped the four-speed and it went to a three-speed. <sighs> That's how they fix reliability, Craig. Just get rid of the overdrive. Just get rid of the overdrive. Just get rid of it. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so my car, are you ready? Yep. Same same era in our family. It was, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain it to you the way that Dad explained it to me. <laughs> he came home one morning. It was a Saturday. And I had slept in a little bit. And he, you know, Dad was everything early. So he was, he was done by 9 a.m. Everything was done that needed to be done. He came home. And he woke me up and said, son, what would you think if we had a fuel-injected 5-liter V8 rear-wheel drive sitting in the driveway? And as a, I don't know, what was I, Craig, probably 10 or 11 years old? Yeah, maybe, yeah. The Fox body was probably my hero at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, it was. And first thing I thought was, holy crap, dad bought a Fox body. <laughs> this is Amazing. And I jumped out of bed, Craig. I had a bunk bed at the time. I jumped out of bed and I ran outside. Much to my surprise, was about 40 feet of fake and peeling wood paneling. <laughs> it was a 1988 Ford Crown Victoria Country Squire, white with wood paneling and blue interior. 
And you know what? I freaking love that thing. It was awesome. Like, uh, we talk about the Hellcat minivan. This was kind of that. Granted, it wasn't fast at all. But it made V8 sounds. It was real drive. It would do donuts, which Dad proved to us multiple times. He put dual exhaust on it. It had a door gate like a, a Range Rover. You know, the door gate, it would go, it would fold down. You could also swing it open. The glass would roll into the door. It had a third row that you faced each other. As a kid, it was amazing. In fact, as an adult, I look for those all the time, too, because they're just like the ultimate <laughs> dad mobile. You could throw whatever engine you want in it. It's huge. They were so comfortable. But, yeah, it was still slow, but I was still excited about it. That thing was super cool. It, it was. Um, yeah, another one of those cars we thought just made so much power, but it didn't. It didn't. It, <laughs> now, it had four gears that worked. I'll give it that. It had the AOD trans, um, which Ford, up until 06, 05, still made that transmission, by the way. And they, in fact, actually they're using the Econoline vans for <laughs> up until about a year ago. So the thing <laughs> has been around forever. It's a pretty solid um, transmission. <laughs> yeah, it kind of works. So it had that, and it had the 5-liter pushrod V8, uh, which was not the mod motor, which would come out just after this car. And do you know how much torque it made, Craig? Mm, I don't know. 180? 200? It made 215. Not bad. Not bad. And the Mustang at the time made 225. And um, <laughs> yeah, so just, just for reference. And then it made, I think it made something like 160 horsepower. I mean, but it, it was one of those insane numbers where the torque, like, darn near was double the horsepower number. Yeah. Like, just so, so silly. Um, but the coolest thing that I remember is the speedometer was not a dial. Do you remember yep. this thing? It was a needle. It was, it was a needle and it sweeped across. There was no tachometer. Yeah. Right. And it, it wasn't sweeped. Nothing, yeah. Yeah. And it would still bounce like an old cable. Style oh, yeah, speedometer. Yeah. You know, so under 20 miles an hour, it kind of just bounced vaguely from zero to 20. It wasn't and real it was accurate. Just, yeah. No, no, no. And by the way, we buried it multiple times. I know you did. I know <laughs> dad did. Um, I didn't. I was too young to drive it, but I definitely did donuts in it. And um, we would we would actually peg it on the trip odometer reset uh, <laughs> button, which was about 105, 110. Yeah, the actual like button. It would physically yeah, it hit would, it. <laughs> it would just physically hit it. The car kept accelerating. There, you know, there was no governor. <laughs> It, in fact, I remember one time you and I counted how long it was on the needle. And so that was our gauge of, oh, we went five seconds past. Last time we only did three seconds past. And it was like, it was great. <laughs> yeah, that's good what stuff. What a fun car. Uh, what a cool it, car. Uh, cool car, true dual exhaust. I remember Dad put that on there. We love that. You know, oh, also, yeah. just thinking back on it, you know, we were raised in a Mopar family just because grandparents and family. You just, sure, you know lineage. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Everybody's got their car, their whatever brand they were raised on. That was kind of the beginning of, you know, we had that spirit debacle with the transmission. Oh, and yeah. The, and the neon was good and bad at the same time. And that was kind of the intro of Ford to our life. And, or I shouldn't say Ford. We had other cars before. That had yeah. so many ones, right? But by and large, he stuck to Mopars. This was the first time we kind of transitioned away from Mopar. Yes. And... It was interesting. It kind of opened our eyes how the, the whole automotive world, how there's a bunch of cool stuff out there. Um, and so it was really neat. It was neat to see that. Um, I do think one of the reasons that car felt so fast because it had one of the worst and best rides on the planet. <laughs> it was yeah. really, really maybe the, one of the softest suspensions ever known to man. For outside sure. of a Cadillac, maybe in the same uh, It was era. in that realm. It was definitely in that realm. But it, it squatted, and when I mean, you hit the brakes and you nosedived, you hit the gas and you just, it, you were pointing to the sky. So oh, yeah. you f it felt fast. It felt like everything was 10 times more aggressive than you were doing. So well, <laughs> that was look, probably a factor. Nimble was not in its vernacular whatsoever. No. no. And it, <clears throat> it also did the same trick of... Uh, that wallow, like you're just talking about that wallow, it had it had no body control. No. So it felt super dramatic, and there were bench seats front and rear. And so when you slid around, you know, it would sit <laughs> eight people, three people per row and two in the back. You just slid from door to door, you know. Yeah. Having another occupant helped you stay close to the steering wheel because it was <laughs> you were just going to go wherever you went, you know. Yes. And it had and, the thinnest steering wheel. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was a – well, Dad used to call it it's a, it's a one-finger drive. You just yeah. kind of – you can, And it you was. Just, and it was. Um, one more thing to add on this. I think why this was so from this particular car was so foundational to us is that it was the first fuel injected V8 we ever had. Mm, and it was Ford yeah. was 
Much like EcoBoost and turbocharging smaller displacement engines in modern trucks, Ford was first to the multi-port fuel injection. And Mm -hmm. I think it was 87 or 86 was the first year that it came out. And by 88, it was kind of, you know, if you got a 5-liter in a truck or a car, it was going to have fuel injection in multi-port. Whereas GM ran throttle body fuel injection, which is Mm -hmm. basically a carburetor-style intake manifold with one or two injectors. Mm -hmm. You know, it's remedial. They ran that all the way up to the late 90s. And Chrysler just ran a carburetor, straight up carburetor. Totally. Yeah. (laughs) And so before this, we had a Fifth Avenue, Chrysler Fifth Avenue, which was, it was carbureted, man. It was slow. And and it was only one year older. It was an 87. Right. Yeah, it was an 87, exactly, which was bonkers to me how much. And so dad would contrast those two cars and go, yeah, we've been doing this wrong for a while. (laughs) So that was was kind of his recollection of that. And then we ended up with some Grand Marquis after that. uh, And then more Crown Vicks and, I ended up with a Crown Vic as an adult. That's a story for another time later on. And uh, so anyways, it, it was impactful to us, and we we have a lot of Fords now, and we're not Ford-specific by any means, but we went through a generation of that being impressed with just mm. the build quality of, of this time. Some fun cars. Uh, oh, what, what a some <laughs> – I do love looking back on these because as much as we thought they were good at the time, they were – let's just – I'll terrible. say this. <laughs> cars have come a long way. The – you know, they used to say they don't make them like they used to. and they don't, Thank goodness they don't make thank them like they used God, to. Thank God, yeah. The, man, we've, I just, I'll just say, like we talked about the EVs earlier, we've come a long way. We've come a really long way. And so, yeah. I'm well, glad, and, and, I'm glad and that's we why I'm not totally anti AV because I, look, there's going to be some refinement involved with an AV because yeah. there's just no moving parts. Like there, there's right. got to be some advantages there. Yeah. Uh, Well, with that, Brian, I think we've got an episode in the books, and uh, I'll let you do the closing out because you're better at it than I am anyways. And uh, It's it's a podcast. Let me get this right. Thanks for watching. Check us out on BreakCheckShow.com. Everything is there. And uh, if you enjoy this nonsense, keep listening. Share it with your family and friends. Well, you got the nonsense part right, and uh, with that, it's a wrap. Thanks, Brian.